introductions. My name is Grant Allen. I'm the CGO Chief Product Officer for one of the groups of Dow Jones that Katie mentioned at the start of the day. So it's the professional information business or, or PIP or PIB. Sometimes called other things. Um, and uh, full disclosure, most of what I'm going to show you today is not my work at all. It's the work of a bunch of other folks in the audience here today. So Victor, Alberto, Tony, Jalma, really interesting ML stuff. Um, plus a, a bunch of developers based in the US and in other places in the world. A little bit of London, but actually not that much on this project. Um, please ask questions at any point, and uh, it'll become pretty obvious the bits that I don't know in depth, because I'll just start throwing those questions to the folks in the audience. OK. Uh, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, what do we actually do in the professional information business? We've been a little vague about what that business is all about and why things like uh, flowable and VPN systems and so forth help us. Um, how we came to choose flowable, and my one and only terrible joke is easy as ABC, anything but closed source. Uh, and we'll talk um, in a high level sort of way about our architecture and then we can dive into. Security in a good way, and how we've really managed to adopt global while keeping our business running at the same time. Um, we have quite a lot of demands. Um, um, some of the future challenges that we're looking forward to, and where we hope to expand our our use both within our professional information business and also in other parts of our organisation. Okay, so <clears throat> to set the scene. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the sort of the core that drives this part of our business. Um, we, many, many, many years ago, um, let's say way back in the last tech boom at the, at the turn of the millennium, Dow Jones uh, went into a joint venture business with another large company and uh, invented this product called Factiva. Some of you may have heard of it, most of you Actually, you may have used it without realizing it. A quick show of hands. How many of you have been to any sort of uh, university or college and study? Yeah. Okay. Quite a few people in the room. All right. How many of those people used the library at your university? Either not just the books, not just those dusty old bits of paper, but you know the online systems that like search for things. Okay. Using those systems, almost. I can always guarantee you that you used Factiva without realizing it. Anytime you searched for a paper or a journal article or a publication, your university library is probably pulling in a bunch of content sets from around the world, and one of them is Factiva. You may have seen it not named Factiva. At most universities, you may have seen something called ProQuest, which is actually just a business that resells Factiva to universities. So. What's in Factiva? It's millions and millions and millions of, in fact, about one and a half billion articles from newspapers, what we call premium publications, as in publications you actually have to pay money for, um, journals, um, research publications, and uh, quite a few websites around the world. And it stretches back to content published from around the mid 20th century, 1950s, 1960s all the way through to today. And every single day, our Factiva environment is receiving over a million articles. Uh, and we never delete anything, so it's just on this constant upward curve. Um, why is that a business? Um, historically, lots of people uh, in very large companies, in government enterprises, um, and, and government departments and agencies used it as a research mechanism if you wanted to find out what was happening with your competition in the markets into which you sold or um, the companies with which you were doing business, you could read up about what was being written about them in the news by subscribing to Factiva. So if you're interested in uh, what was happening with Flowable, for instance, I've recently if I jump on Factiva, I can probably find a few articles about uh, Flowable if I, if I look at it. Um, today, that is still an important business for us, but more important is where we see a lot of use for large amounts of textual data. And I think some of you in the room can probably think about how that could be really, really useful as a resource for things like 
any particular <coughs> text processing, text mining, natural language processing, sentiment analysis, you name it, those sorts of projects uh, where we're finding an enormous amount of interest. And we do the same things ourselves with this content and all of what I talk about will make that evident. <coughs> so that's, that's our world. That's what my part of the business does. Um, we have parts of the business that print newspapers, and so that's a fun business to be in, but it doesn't really interest me. I'm more interested in this. What happens with that content when we ingest it, when we bring it into our systems, is it flows through uh, something that we call a content pipeline, which is a broad collection of tools that look to understand in various ways what's in each one of those articles, what's mentioned in there. For those of you who've done any kind of text processing, this is sort of your classic feature extraction. Can we see where entities are mentioned? Can we find events? Can we find um, interesting terms, nouns, you name it? Uh, and then either note those down, we annotate a lot of these articles, we have our own um, fairly well-regarded taxonomy where we can apply meaningful names about uh, industries, about subjects, about geographies, and a bunch of other interesting things to these articles as they flow through. Anyone who's ever done the, the dirty work of any ML work will know that writing the, the fun model is about 2% of your job. And cleaning up your data and tagging it and making sure that it's ready to use, uh, that's the other 98% of your job. This is, this is doing some of that for you, but it's not, I think Yulia will quite happily say, this, this is a good start, but it's not exactly going to turn it into a, a magic data set for you to use However, we do a lot of other things. We have some rule-based coding that attempts <coughs> parse documents and extract some very interesting things, and I'll talk about a few of those uh, use cases when I talk about the actual processes that we have. Um, we get these articles from 33,000 publishers around the world. And I can pretty much, with a few exceptions, guarantee you that every one of those publishers has their own idea of what the perfect format for an article is, and they're not the same. So we have to do this enormous amount of normalization work to try and um, basically transform the text content we have coming in. And it's not just the text of an article, but it's also who wrote it, when it was written, um, if it was published somewhere else originally and then republished somewhere else. We transform it into uh, an internal format. Uh, I won't bore you with those details. Um, and then we do have um, sort of tactical use of various bits of ML and so forth. It's not a grand overarching unified approach. It's more a case of where there's a good use for it. We'll take that out of the toolkit and start using it, and we'll talk about, about some of those cases as well. Um, so the, the real problem that we had is um, maybe best exemplified by this office. If you walk around this building, we have three floors in this building. It's, it's great. Uh, some nice views out of the mountains and so forth. But if you walk around, you realize that this building can only fit about, I'd say, three or 400 people. And we were literally using people as our scheduling mechanism. When we get more content and want to do more things for our businesses, we would instinctively say, well, that's great. How many um, editors and researchers? I'll explain the role in just a minute. How many of those people do we add to uh, enable us to do things like, for instance, we have a business that tracks significant financial crimes. And it does that through analyzing the text in newspaper articles for things like court cases, police action, <coughs> Uh, fraud investigations, corruption investigations, and those sorts of things. Let's add some people who know how to research that. Um, it's a pretty popular business. Apparently, stealing money is a great way of making money. <laughs> um, so, you know, how do we scale that? Well, we could just add more people and add more people. That runs into some classic scaling problems, and we thought there's, there's a, a better way. A lot of us have um, explored those ways in other places, and we thought we need, we need a way of doing that here that lets us take what are some actually quite skilled researchers and get the best out of them in terms of making judgment decisions around edge cases, looking at more sophisticated approaches rather than the tedious work of reading an article and deciding, is this a, really a financial crime? Or is this a movie review for Ocean's Eleven, which was a movie about a financial crime? And if I put George Clooney on a list of financial criminals, I'm probably not going to have a job tomorrow. Okay. So that's, that's kind of our world. We wanted to use uh, the best in class technologies to try and help us move away from pure human scaling to a blended model, use people in the best possible positions where their judgment, their skill, their expertise really helps us. Um, the, the 
I'll be absolutely candid with you. Our goal here was not to get rid of anyone. We we're in fact still growing people. It was just to scale and be able to do much, much more with the people that we have. So, we knew VPN was part of the solution. It's not magic. It doesn't just do your work for you out of the box. But it really, really helps um, force some serious questions around standardizing what it is you are doing. Do you even agree with each other about what your tasks are? Um, I think most of you in the room probably realize if you, if you attempt to automate a confused, chaotic, and poorly understood task, you just get automated confusion and chaos. You can actually get a better outcome together. Um, so this was a good forcing function for us. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of benefit we get from this in some other areas which I'll talk about in a moment. So that's, that's our business in a nutshell. That's why we wanted to look at BPM solutions in general, uh, which then had us think long and hard about which solution should we choose? What what are we actually going to use at the end of the day? And we started doing this in 2017, and uh, we went to um, some effort to take a look at what was out there. Um, and this is just a small selection. We we asked our question, uh, ourselves questions around um, how heavy do we want our VPN solution to be? There are other solutions out there, not just these ones, these like Pega and so forth, where uh, um, other ones I've worked with in the past, like JRules and, and so forth, where it's a case of, great, I'm going to be up to my eyeballs in Java for the rest of my life, because that's what's required to get anything out of some of these systems. Um, versus some of the more lightweight uh, approaches where uh, you can sort of selectively use, um, in some cases, just the modeling notation capabilities, or um, some parts of the actual execution framework, but then do some of the other work in other areas. And we have an existing environment. We are, as a company, about 130 years old. Um, now, we didn't have sort of this kind of technology 130 years ago, but certainly over the years, we have grown all kinds of different bits and pieces of technology. So we probably um, were a bit uh, wary of taking some of the heavier weight VPM options just because we know how painful those sorts of systems can be over time. So we gravitated more towards some of the, what we consider the, the, the lighter weight, easier to adopt, and easier to gradually introduce kind of systems, which meant uh, we were flowable, we were Kamunda. Uh, some of us have had some experience with activity in the past, so that heritage really helped us uh, quickly understand what was, what was being offered. But we had a few other things we were interested in. Um, we had internal systems for building sort of forms driven applications, but we wanted something that we could quickly um, mock up or model what a process might look like where new forms were created or a form was introduced where it hadn't traditionally been part of the process. So knowing that those sorts of things were out there uh, was thrown into the, into the mix. Um, support was kind of interesting. In fact, the fact that you're all sitting in this room was important to us. We needed to see uh, something that wasn't abandoned, that had a vibrant and active community, that had um, support options available. Uh, not because we absolutely had to have them, but it just gives you that overall confidence that there are different approaches. We could change our mind next week and say, actually, we're not interested in running this ourselves anymore. We want to give it to somebody else to run on our behalf and be confident that that would work. Um, equally, if we get uh, that thrilled about it, uh, some of the folks in the back of the room tell them John, although they might want to actually start contributing. He's one of the 166 who contributed this year. Maybe not? Okay. So, we, it, to, to cut this short, we ran a bit of a shootout. Um, flowable on balance was um, the best option. And looking back, sort of a year and a half back in time, um, we had absolutely no regrets. We still think it was the best choice. So, that's our world. That's how we came to choose Flowable. I'm not going to deal with sort of uh, any of the, the start. fun that we had. We had instances running. We had our former CTO pestering Victor to say, hey, I want, I want my own version. Give me access to this. Make, make a copy for me. That's easily done with this. I think you all know that. If we fast forward to today, I want to show you what we currently do in terms of our AWS environment. We do deploy this into Amazon Web Services. We use a bunch of um, features that you probably could guess before seeing a diagram like this. Sorry, that's a bit small in places. Um, but I want to describe how, this is how we deploy, not just. Uh, sorry, the other previous slide, some of those options that you were looking at, 
Could you maybe highlight some of the main reasons what what the differences were that <coughs> made you uh, decide on Photo? Yeah. Um, it was actually interesting that um, at, at one point uh, Kamunda was one that we were looking at because it had a couple of extra things that were appealing at the time. The, um, the modeler tool that Kamunda makes available um, um, was superficially very attractive to a bunch of our colleagues because they saw that as the, oh great, I just use the modeler tool and it's all done. And, and we said, well actually no, that's, you know, there are other modeling tools out there that the whole notion of having VPMN as the you know, fundamental language that describe what these processes in means it actually doesn't matter. We could use Kamunda's modeler and still deploy the models over in uh, global or some other engine. Um, one of the um, main things we were looking at, and I'll talk about this in, in just a moment, is the data, one of, one of the big decision <coughs> points we had and one of the big drivers we had was these processes that we're running here are under heavy, heavy scrutiny, um, both in, inside the business, but also from our customers and from um, regulators in government around the world. Um, our customers want to know things like, um, for somebody added to a terrorist watch list, how quickly are we reviewing that person and putting them on the list? Um, for our research teams, we have some guarantees about how quickly we send out uh, information about people placed on a sanctions list. So this week, for instance, there will be 80, 18 Saudi nationals added to the do not fly list for the EU. And our customers would want to know that we had them on that, on the list that we provide them within eight hours. And so there's a lot of, um, if you like, transactional reporting and um, analysis that we wanted to do. And one of the things that attracted us to Flowable was, A, the, the, even simple things like the database schema was pretty well known. It's, inherited from activity. There's obviously been evolution since then, but that was much easier to, to use as a data resource after the fact. The, the runtime system is one thing, but having options to get at that sort of data in multiple different ways, we found the flowable approach attractive, particularly with the historical data versus the runtime data. Um, just ease of setup was, a, was another one. The fact that you can just spin up a concatenating system and have it run that's sort of well-known sort of uh, task. But some of the much more heavyweight options, um, we we have a very, let's, let's call it a, a lean resourcing model internally where we, we don't have people just sitting around who can um, you know, stop reading their paper. Um, um, stop reading the paper and say, oh great, I can, I can help you sell this stack for the next six months. No, we need something that was very, very quick to set up and deploy and that teams individually could do themselves without having to rely on central expertise. So that's sort of two or three of the, the things that attracted us to global. Okay, um, this this back to this um, apparently complex diagram. What this is actually showing is sort of our, our normal um, approach to deploying things and developing things at Dow Jones. And it's actually we're reading it from right to left. We have, um, like most in development environments, um, separate logical environments for um, development, for bringing together developed artifacts into an integration environment, for moving those to a staging environment, and then promoting more into production. Um, when we started this process in 2017, at that point in time, we had one shared environment for development across the PIB part of Dow Jones, and another shared environment in Amazon for all of the production of systems. And pretty much at the same point we were adopting Flowable and rolling out, we then thought actually we need a quite a more sophisticated approach in Amazon. We can't have all of our systems in one production environment um, because we had uh, some, some actual instances where one system that has nothing to do with our professional information business suddenly starts consuming resources that starve some of our other systems. <coughs> yes, we can sort of dynamically allocate and use the, the bursting capability of the cloud, but um, there are also concerns about, well, just how quickly can that happen and what are the other impacts you have. So we were reorganizing to um, adopt Amazon's landing zone concept in anger. Um, and we, we basically use those as um, sort of functional groupings. So anything that is touching um, data about the people and companies mentioned in all of these articles that we're processing for the 
professional information business tends to get grouped into one landing zone, things that are about publishing Wall Street Journal are in another landing zone, things that are about running our internal building systems are probably in another landing zone, and so on and so forth. Um, so more secure, but also more complex to manage because we now have issues around peering, which landing zone can talk to which other landing zone. Routing, can you just route Amazon to Amazon, which is great, but we still have on-premises um, services and systems that we need to call, so we route back to our own physical data centers on the east coast of the US. And in some instances, we have to ask ourselves, is that the best routing to go back to our own data centers and then back out to Amazon for some of our processes? Um, we actually hit some um, boundaries in terms of numbers of um, uh, peering arrangements that you can have between landing zones on Amazon. So it's always great to tell someone like Amazon that they have a scale. <laughs> we have some we have some history with that. We've told Google that they don't have enough bandwidth, we've told Amazon that they can't scale. It's a fun conversation. <laughs> okay, so that's that's kind of the ideal. Um, we don't use all of these environments with, with the flowable uh, deployment. We don't actually have separate um, uh, development and integration and staging and production environments, but uh, that's just because we've got the best developers working on it, so they work good. <laughs> Um, however, what we do have, and this is sort of transitioning to our reality, and I knew I promised I wasn't going to run the time that I am going to, um, we, we have a model that, when you pull apart some of those layers, looks like this. This is the flowable engine itself. Uh, it's authorized, it's running in a, in a container. Um, and alongside the core flowable uh, BPMN environment, if you like, we have the layer that we have added that talks to our line of business systems, our systems that handle all of this content up here in Factiva uh, and some of the others that I'll mention in a moment. Um, uh, this is something that we, we knew that we had to do as part of making this a success, right? You don't just say there's a fully described task. If that task has to do things that are outside the flowable, then you need to write code to make those things happen. Where, wherever possible, we use RESTful APIs to work with Flowable, but also to work with our other systems. Um, uh, sometimes you don't have RESTful APIs, sometimes you have old-fashioned SOAP APIs and things like that, but regardless, the, the same sort of API-first mentality applies. So um, some of the other systems you see over here are kind of the artifacts that you have when you have an existing environment, you are working with an existing set of systems, and you have to gradually move to a, a BPM driven world, um, but you can't stop all those other systems at the same time. So the Google Sheets thing is an interesting um, example. This is something that we use both to trigger actions, to trigger um, uh, processes kind of like and so forth. Um, just through literally, is there a line in that Google Sheet that needs to trigger an action? But it's uh, the, the reason we still do that is because historically, we would literally have researchers coming. We have what are known as country researchers. It's literally, you're doing Albania, you're doing Austria, you're doing Australia, you're doing uh, Azerbaijan, you're doing Andorra. Um, there's, there's some groupings there. And literally, we would have people walking in the morning and say, great, I now need to search the news for anything that mentions Azerbaijan today and see if there's any content that needs further processing. And they'd literally be checking the work of these in this spreadsheet. So we slowly adapted that model to trigger tasks. Um, but it also was used as a, um, a reporting and feedback mechanism. Right? Is the work done? How much work has been done? And so forth. And so we were actually writing code that's, that's instead of somebody manually updating those reports, is pumping the information directly from Flowable and the related systems out. Um, and we will eventually wean them off this, and I'll talk about this BI layer in a moment. Um, but that's basically our work. Um, uh, one, a couple of things here, um, just to highlight, this is not the, um, the, the, the curing mechanism that you heard mentioned before. The, the signature box on the, the right, what does it do? Very good question. This is another one of our systems that helps us um, identify which company is which and which companies we should be worried about. So for us, a, a signature uh, or a signature system is all about um, Parsing incoming articles, saying so this article is about um, Apple, 
and then providing a bunch of markers, a bunch of what we call signals, um, and related data around, ah, the Apple mentioned in this article is Apple Computer, based in uh, <coughs> Park in California, no, it's based in Cupertino in California, and not Apple, the record company, uh, based in somewhere in the UK. Um, but it's also a, um, the system that, um, to some extent, governs what we know about companies um, in terms of everything from stock tickers, market capitalization, who's in, of interest in terms of company executives or board members, all those sorts of things. So it's another one about quirky legacy systems. Under the hood, it is probably 20 or 30 different systems, all with probably five to 10 years of heritage into them. So, uh, and DMI, the one at the top, is uh, it's not a very imaginative acronym. It's our data management interface. It is literally when our human researchers need to see content, or need to see information about a company, it's the system that actually presents everything in a forms-based approach, allows them to edit things, allows them to confirm that some of the things they're seeing, and this is one of the hallmarks of what Dow Jones does, is we automate as much as we can, and, and continue to automate as much as we can with things like Flowable, but we have a, um, a human in the loop um, ethos here where final decisions are approved by a human researcher. So if we want to say um, that there is uh, a wealth of negative press about Facebook this week, and there is, there's yet another Facebook scandal, there'll be a human at the end of the day saying, yes, those articles are articles with negative sentiment about Facebook, just as an example. Okay, I'm going to speed up because I've only got like minus one minute or so. Um, uh, so this cube is much more about our internal signals processes. It's not really related to the cube, the revenue cube stuff that you think about when you think about global. Um, this BI layer down here, um, it's really interesting to hear the progress on the historical database because it's one of the things that we have really um, dwelt on in the last six to 12 months is um, we have a lot of uses for that historical data. We know we can't keep it in the runtime database because for us, it's just going to be huge. But we also need to blend it with a lot of data from a lot of other systems. Like our DMI system, we need to know which um, services within DMI that sit outside Flowable have interacted with data from task. Um, we want to link it back to articles of activity. We want to do a bunch of other business processes around that content. And so um, we don't want all of that data also sitting inside any of the flowable persistence layers. So we're looking at, um, yet again, another Aurora DB, um, and tools like QuickSight or other reporting tools that let us pull out a copy of everything from the systems and then do um, all of our analytics, all of our business reporting internally, <coughs> some of our external reporting as well from a common environment like that. Okay, really quickly, how we build and how we deploy um, this is our staging environment that we use. Um, a lot of the actions here probably self-explanatory about the picking branch, saying that that's a candidate for uh, moving to staging and so forth. Uh, Artifactory is probably the main thing I want to point out here. The Dockerized environment is registered in Artifactory as a, a, a complete deployable entity. Um, the, uh, the process then, once we're happy that we have a um, well-verified, um, if you like, approved um, iteration of the environment to deploy is, <coughs> after all, the GitHub fun and dancing in, in uh, staging and so forth. Um, when we move to production, um, pretty much the short version is that blessed version in Artifactory, that sort of complete package of what we want to deploy, is just pulled out of Artifactory and, and deployed into production. Uh, and notion that we can do this as often as we like, the reality is, I don't know, how many times do we do this? Maybe, yeah, maybe once a month. Um, we have some interesting legacy issues around having other systems that are too tightly coupled, which means we can go faster, but they can't, so we have to slow down a bit. Okay, um, wrapping things up, some challenges that we have. I showed you that earlier diagram where we put our custom code into the same container as global, we want to move to an environment where they are more decoupled so that we can iterate our code and leave the flowable environment alone or experiment with upgrades to flowable without having to change our code. And, uh, user and group integration is interesting, not because flowable doesn't have options, but because we had a separate internal mechanism for managing the researchers and we wanted to use that same mechanism for um, 
the list of people that could allocate the task or choose a task in the same flowable. So we've had to do some work ourselves to push that concept of user groups into flowable. And we want to do a bunch of other stuff in the future. Um, uh, an interesting, uh, I think the most interesting thing here is what we're doing right now, um, exploring uh, one, one really interesting use cases. We have some of these articles coming into our system, users saying, actually, no, this article is not at all what we thought it was. This is not um, what we call an adverse media article. It's not about a company, and it's not bad news for that company. Send it back. Send some signal back to our system. Um, what we've been working on recently with Yulia's input is a classifier that basically helps us understand what's wrong. What went wrong when we originally flagged that article, send it back to the beginning, if you like, of the, the entire flow of pipeline, back, back to the system that sits in front of that, um, and try and learn, literally, what makes uh, for an interesting article about bad news about company. Okay, so that's it. And I'm only five minutes over time. There you go. <laughs>